Well, good morning. Uh, we're in a sermon series called What Matters Most, and the question is, are you and I doing it? Are we doing it? What matters most, and are we doing it? Our goal in this series is to uh, help you and I become great lovers, great lovers of God and great lovers of others. And today we're looking at loving with our words, loving with our words. And once again, these, uh, this sermon series kind of builds one round on top of the other. So if this is your first shot at this, uh, this is round three of a five-part series. And I'd encourage you to go on our website um, or YouTube us and, um, and look at those other two because they really do form a foundation for where we're at now and where we're going to go over the next couple of weeks. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into it. God, thank you so much for your presence with us here. God, we thank you that you love us, that you wrap your arms around us, that you're not afraid to touch us. <laughs> and you do. And that's what we want to ask you to do today. We want to ask that you reach out and touch us. As we sit at your feet, Lord, we want to hear. We want to have ears to hear. And minds to conceive and hearts to receive the particular message that you have for each and every one of us. And so speak to us, Lord. So as we leave here today, we leave here as more than just hearers of your word, but as doers. And all God's people said, Amen. There's an old saying, I think everybody here knows it, confession is good for the soul, right? Confession is good for the soul. And so I want to begin this morning with a confession, a confession that didn't originate with me, but it certainly includes me, and it probably includes you. It comes out of James chapter 3, verse 2. It says, we all stumble in many ways. We all stumble in many ways. Anybody here agree with that? We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man. A perfect man. Now, women... How many perfect men do you know? <laughs> men, how many perfect women do you know? Uh, one, <laughs> his wife. <laughs> well, because of that, because none of us are perfect, we talk about that here every, every single week. Because of that, it's no big deal for me to stand up here and confess that when it comes to my words, I sometimes say some pretty stupid stuff. I do. Uh, anybody else ever fall in that category of saying stupid stuff? Let me give you just one example. My wife, of course, could give you hundreds. She's out at the coffee bar. You're welcome to ask. But let me give you one. Back when we lived in Ohio, uh, I was in a grocery store in Upper Sandusky, Ohio. It was a little town we were living in at that time. And I went up to pay the teller. And I noticed that she was a young mom that I had seen in church with her husband and her kids for the very first time just a couple of weeks before. And they were sitting in the back of the sanctuary, and you, you actually came in through the back. And so I saw them there, and so I pulled over and, and had a little conversation with them. And they seemed like a really nice young couple, and I was excited that they were there. Well, when I saw her standing behind the counter, I smiled, and she smiled back, and I could tell that she recognized me. And then I noticed something that I'd never noticed before. And so, hoping to build relationship, I said, oh, I didn't know you were pregnant. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was just trying to build a relationship. Her smile disappeared, her eyes lit up, and I'm telling you, if she could have reached across there and ripped me into pieces, she would have. And she said, I'm not. Do I look like I'm pregnant? Yeah, hear this, I never, I never saw her or her family in church ever again, wow. ever. Sometimes if you're like me, you say some pretty stupid stuff, stuff you wish you could take back, stuff you wish you hadn't said, and because of that, when it comes to our words, to our communication, a lot of us get frustrated, don't we? We get frustrated because we never seem to get it right. Well, in a few moments, I want us to take and look at some practical ways for you and I to try to get it right, to have, make a positive difference in our communication so we can love others better with our words. But hear this, before we can go there, 
Before we can really look at what it means to love others better with our words, we need to look on the inside. We need to look at who we really are on the inside. Why? Hear this, because whether you and I like it or not, our mouths, our mouths will display who we really are on the inside. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 34, for out of the overflow of the heart, out of the overflow of your heart and out of the overflow of my heart, the mouth speaks. You know what that means? That means on the inside, if I'm filled with love, if I'm filled with joy, if I'm filled with peace, if I'm filled with wholeness of life, then when I speak, I'm going to speak love and joy and peace and wholeness of life. But on the inside... If I'm filled with bitterness and selfishness and hatred and all kinds of other negative emotions, then when I speak, I'm going to spew out bitterness and selfishness and hatred and all kinds of other emotions. Why? Because my mouth is going to speak what's in my heart. But that's not all. Hear this. That is not all. There's another truth that Jesus teaches us. He says in Mark chapter 7, verse 15, our souls, hear this, our souls aren't harmed by what we eat. In other words, our souls aren't harmed by what we take in, but he says our souls are harmed by what we think and say, by what comes out of us. In other words, the thoughts and the words that you and I think and speak out, they actually spill back. They spill back into our hearts, into our minds, and they destroy our souls. You know what that means? That means sometimes for you and me, we got this reciprocal thing kind of going on, where we feel angry and bitter on the inside, and so we speak those angry and bitter words, but instead of making us feel better, Those angry, bitter words are actually going to pour back into our hearts and back into our minds and make us feel even more angry and more bitter. And thereby creating this downward, terrible, self-destructive spiral that destroys us at the very core of who we are, our souls. And so the question becomes, how do you and I get out of that? How do you and I get out of that, of that terrible, self-destructive spiral? How? How? Well, in Matthew 20, 20, excuse me, 11, verse 28, Jesus offers us help. He says, come to me, all who are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Take my yoke upon you. Friends, in Jesus' day, a rabbi's yoke was his teaching. That's what the yoke is. It is his teaching. And so Jesus is saying, take my teaching upon you and learn from me. For I am humble and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Now, what's he saying? He's saying, do you want to find rest for your souls? Do you? Do you want to have a heart of love that produces words of love? And do you want to have words of love that produce a heart of love? If you do, he says, then you need to do two things. First, he says, you need to come to me. You need to call on me. You need to say, Lord, I want to change. I want to be different. I want my heart to be different. I want my mind to be different. I want my life to be different. I want my words to be different. And so, Lord, help me. Help me. And he says, I will. I will give you rest. But then he says the second thing. He says, I can't give you rest. That's the essence of what he's saying here. I can't give you rest unless unless you take my yoke, my teachings upon you. Why? Well, friends, when you actually yoke two animals together, when you team them up, the more experienced and the stronger those two animals will do two things. First, he'll take on more of the weight. That stronger, more experienced animal will take on more of the weight. And second, he'll teach that younger animal how to pull more productively. He'll teach it how to push through and when to ease up and how and when to plow around the rocks in life. And so Jesus says, if you want to find rest, then take my yoke, my teachings upon you. And when you do, he says, I'm going to come alongside of you. And I'm going to take on more of the weight of your life. I'm going to take it on. And then I'm going to teach you how to live life more productively. I'm going to teach you how to push through and when to ease up and how and when to plow around the rocks of your life. That's why Jesus says, come to me. 
and take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Because when you do, there will be rest for your souls. And so the question is, have you done that? Have you done what he's ex expected you to do if you want to really be able to live in the fullness of life? Now, with that word of encouragement, I want us to dive into some specific ways that you and I, as we're yoked to Jesus, can learn to love people with our words. First, love people with honest words. Honest words. This is going to take your memory back a little bit. What, what is the goal of every disciple? The goal of every disciple is to become like their rabbi, to become like their teacher. And so in our case, that means we, our goal is to become like Jesus. And friends, when you and I look at Jesus, we're going to see that one of the things that he did was that he loved people enough to be honest with them. Hear me. He loved them enough to be honest with them. Why? Both for their good, hear this, for their good, but also for the good of the whole world. For the good of the whole world. And when I talk about good here, I'm talking about exactly the way Jesus used it when he talked about only God is good. In other words, I'm using it to help us understand that Jesus spoke honest words to people because he wanted people to become like God. To become good as God is good. And so he spoke honest words with them even when sometimes those honest words weren't nice. For example, one day, Jesus turned to a bunch of religious leaders. They were, hear this, in that day where they were the, some of the most highly respected, highly honored and regarded people of that day. He turned to them, and he called them hypocrites to their faces. Now, hear me. Was that nice? No. No. Was it for their good? Yes. Why? So that they could become more like God. On another occasion, he actually turns to Peter, one of his closest disciples, and he calls him Satan. He says, Satan, get behind me. Now, was that nice? No. Was it for his good? Yes. Why? So he could become more like God. One day, Jesus was frustrated with all of his disciples, and he said, you stubborn and faithless people, how long do I have to put up with you? Now, if you're a parent, you understand that, right? <laughs> how long do I have to put up with you? But was that nice? No. Was it a challenge to wake up, to get on board, to start thinking and becoming more like God? Absolutely, yes. Friends, catch this. Hear this. If you and I love people like Jesus does, we will love them enough to be honest with them, even when it's not nice. How many here have actually ever sat down with a friend and you look that friend in the eye and you say, you know what, I really love you, I really do. And you do. You do love him. And it's because of that love that you have to say this to him. You say, you know what, sometimes you're a jerk. I mean, the truth is, sometimes you're just a first class jerk. And if you don't humble yourself, if you don't change your attitude, if you don't ask for forgiveness from God and others, then pretty soon you're going to be hanging out here all by yourself because nobody likes to hang out with a first class jerk. I'll be honest. How many here sometimes find it easier to be nice than to be honest? I know I do. Why? Because when you're nice, you don't have to have those kind of conversations, right? You don't, you don't have to talk about that kind of stuff. And so in some ways, it's easier to be nice than it is to be honest. But hear me, is it better? Is it really? Is it really better for your friend? And hear me, what kind of friend are you? If all you're willing to do is be nice and not be honest. Here's the problem. Friends, when we're nice and not honest, nothing changes. People don't change. Relationships don't change. Heart don't change. Lives don't change. Nothing changes. Which is exactly why Jesus, a friend of sinners, chooses to be lovingly honest with his words. Friends, hear this, he was committed, he was committed to lay down his life even to see those that he loved changed. Changed for their good and the good of the whole world. Now, how do you and I become like that? How do you and I become lovingly honest like Jesus? Well, Ephesians 4.15 says, speak the truth in love. Friends, that's how it works. 
If you and I want to become lovingly honest like Jesus, it takes both truth and love. Not one or the other. It takes both truth and love. Now, that's a whole lot easier said than done, right? I mean, the truth is, (laughs) there are some people here today. There are some people here today who are all about truth, aren't you? I mean, that's the truth. You are all about truth. As a matter of fact, some of you use truth as a weapon. You actually shoot people down rather than build them up. But that's not what we're about. about. That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about using people as target practice. We're talking about speaking the truth in love. And that means that when you and I speak that truth, we do it, hear this, in a heart and out of a context of love and relationship where people know we love them, where they know we care about them. And so they know we're not just going to drop some bomb on them and then walk away. No, we're going to be there to pick up the pieces. We're going to help them wrap up the wounds. We're going to help them in the healing process. Which is why Proverbs 27, 6 says, Wounds from a friend. Hear this. Wounds from a friend can be trusted. They can be trusted. Why? Because true friends don't carelessly cut you and leave you to bleed out like a thief in the night. They carefully cut you. They do cut. They carefully cut you like a surgeon removing a cancer from yourself. And then they carefully help patch you up so that you can be whole again. Now, before we move on, let me remind us of one more word from Jesus, and it's this. Hear this. Before you and I go out and try to do the delicate surgery of removing a speck from somebody else's eye, We need to be sure that we don't have a log in our own. In other words, before you and I go out and be honest with others about their lives, you and I need to be honest with God about ours. And then in His grace and with His help, we need to make adjustments accordingly. First, love people with honest words. Second, love people with careful words. Careful words. Why? Because the truth is, words have power. They have power. Proverbs 18.21 says, The tongue has the power of life and death. The words have the power of life and death. And so we need to use them very, very carefully. When I was in junior high, I don't know if you guys can remember back this far or not, but the words freak and freak out were really big words. I don't know why. I can't remember why. But they were huge words. My buddies and I used those words all the time. We'd say freak this and freak that. You name it, we probably called it freak. It was just a really big word. That's the truth. One day, my sister Terry and I were having an argument, and she wasn't listening to the voice of reason, me. At least that's what I thought, and that's the truth. And before I realized what I was doing... I called my sister Terry a freak. And as soon as I said that, I instantly watched her face go from angry to utterly broken. And on that day, I learned that freak had an entirely different meaning for somebody that was born with a hair lip and a double cleft palate. Proverbs 12, 18 says, Reckless words. Pierce like a sword. They pierce like a sword. I will never forget the reckless word I spoke to my sister. And I'll bet she hasn't forgotten it either. Words have power. Genesis 1 says that God spoke a word, a word, and creation leapt into being. Words have power for good and for bad, for life and for death. Words have power. And so, friends, you and I need to be very, very, very careful with our words. Now, I want to target two different areas the Bible says we need to be very careful in with our words. The first is our anger. Our anger. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 says, In your anger, do not sin. Now, notice, it doesn't say anger in and of itself is a sin. It says, in your anger, do not sin. Now, sin's a really interesting word, right? People have all kinds of images in their mind about sin. But actually, the most common word in all the New Testament for sin is an old Greek archery term where the archer would take his bow and he'd pull back that arrow. And when he would release that arrow through the air, when it would fly through the air and it would hit the target, 
if it would hit any other part of the target other than the bullseye. The judge who would there was there would call out sin. They had missed the mark. They missed the mark. And so sin is missing the mark of God. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul says anger in and of itself is not sin. Anger in and of itself is not missing the mark of God. Why? Because anger in and of itself is a God-given gift. Hear this. It's a God-given gift to empower you and me to take action. To take action against wrong and to fight for the right. It is a God-given gift to take action for his causes. But it also can be misused, just like any gift. Now back to Ephesians 4. It says, in your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Now once again, anger in itself is not sin. But friends, hear this. When you and I allow anger to control us, when we allow it to make us a meistic maniac that's so caught up in getting our way, we can't think of anything else, then that's sin. That is missing the mark of God. For example, do you know my, that my wife, Deb, actually gets in arguments with me? Her pastor. <laughs> she actually argues with her pastor. As a matter of fact, I remember our first really big argument. We'd only been married a couple of months, and you need to understand this about this before I go into what happened. Before we got married, I never, never, never hung up my shirts, all right? My shirts were awfully, always perfectly flying on the floor or in the corner or wherever they ended up. I didn't care. It didn't matter to me. But when we got married, I decided to honor my wife. I decided I was going to start hanging up my shirts, and I did every single day I hung up my shirts because I knew this was a thing for her, right? It's a thing for her. And friends, when you and I get married, we become one, and their thing becomes our thing, right? That's the way it works if you're doing it right. One day, I was hanging up my shirts, and uh, as I always hung up my shirts, and I could feel this heated presence move in behind me. And so I turn, and there's Deb. And I'm telling you, she is lit up. You could literally see the smoke coming out of her ears. This girl is lit up. But, of course, being the typical guy, I have no idea what's going on. And, but at least I'm a smart enough guy to ask the question, "Hun, what's wrong? And to my complete and utter amazement, she says, it's your shirts. And I'm like, my shirts? What do you mean it's my shirts? And in my head, I start thinking, I'm hanging on my shirts for the very first time in my life. I'm hanging them up for you. I never hung up my shirts. And then I say to her, well, you know, what's wrong with my shirts? And she says, well, they're not all facing in the same direction. <laughs> and none of them have the top two buttons buttoned. You know what I learned on that day? Besides the fact that I had some shirt etiquette I didn't know anything about I needed to learn. I learned that communication, even with your dearest loved one, can become a battleground. That's what I learned. And friends, hear this. When communication becomes a battleground, when two people are trying to get their own way, when there are winners and when there are losers, there is only one winner, and that one winner is called the, the evil one. He's the only one who wins when that kind of battleground is taking, take, taking place. That's why Ephesians 4 warns us not to give Satan a foothold by being controlled by our anger. Instead, it tells us to work it out. To work it out before the sun goes down. Now, why does God say that? Why does God say, don't let the sun go down in your anger? Because it's simply this. He knows. I mean, think about this. He designed us. He wired us. He understands how we're wired. And so he knows that anger in us is like milk. It's like milk. If you leave it out overnight, it's going to spoil. All right? And so he says, don't let the sun go down in your anger. Because if you do, you're going to give Satan a foothold in your relationship. Now, just so you know, Deb and I did exactly that. We did. We addressed our anger. We gave forgiveness to one another. And also, just so you know, Times have changed in the Heinz house. Now when I go to hang my shirts, I only have to button one button. 
instead of two. <laughs> number one, be careful with anger with your words. Also, two, number two, be careful with gossip. Be careful with gossip. Here's the thing about gossip. Gossip is one of those things that most of us don't think very much about, do we? I mean, for most of it, it's kind of like a minor offense. But hear this. That is not how God sees it. As a matter of fact, God sees gossip as being up there in his eyes with murder and stealing. Did you know that? God puts gossip up there with murder and stealing. Why? Because gossip is verbal murder and it's stealing. It's stealing somebody else's reputation. It's kind of like the woman who one night saw her pastor escorting a drunken woman who wasn't his wife out of a bar and into his car. When this woman saw that, she got on her cell phone and she started making call after call after call. By the next morning, she had spread the rumor all over town that her pastor was having an affair. Well, as soon as that pastor found out, he immediately called that woman into his office and he brought in his wife. And then he turned to his wife and he said, honey, what did we do last night? And she looked at him kind of curious because they hadn't had a chance to talk and she had no idea about any of the rumor stuff going on. And she said, well, we were at home. But then, you know, so-and-so called and, and she was drunk again. And so we hopped in our car and we went down to the bar. And when we got there, you got out and you went in and you brought her to the car and you helped her in. And then we dropped her off at her house and that was about it. Well, of course, when this other woman heard the story, she was filled with shame and with regret. And she said, Pastor, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. I am so sorry. And with that, he said, I forgive you. I really do. I forgive you. But if you would, I'd like you to do something for me. And she said, anything, Pastor, anything. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. With that, he took out a feather pillow. And he ripped that feather pillow open. And he said, I want you to take this pillow. And just walk around town. And I want to have you spread these feathers wherever you go. And when you're done, just come on back. And so without a question, she took that pillow, pillow and, and spread those feathers all over town. And when she was done, she came back to the office and she said, Pastor, I did it. I spread those feathers all over town just like you asked me to. Now, am I done? He said, no, not quite. I want to ask you to do one more thing for me. And she said, anything, pastor, anything, you just tell me what it is. He said, I want you to go back, and I want you to pick up every one of those feathers that you spread all over this town. She said, pastor, I can't do that. I spread those feathers all over town. The wind's been blowing all night long, and so there's no way I'm going to be able to gather them all up and bring them back here to you. And he said, I know. I know. I just wanted you to realize what you've done to my reputation. You've thrown it into the wind, and now there is no way anybody can go around and gather it all back up again and bring it back to me. Friends, gossip. Gossip is one of those things you and I don't think very much about. It's kind of a minor offense until it happens to us. Until it happens to us. The next time you're ready to pass around some juicy little story, make sure you know the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And then before you pass that story on, ask yourself, would I be sharing this story if that person was right here and right now with us? Would I be sharing if they were here? And if I did, if I did share it, would it build them up or would it tear them down? And then before you pass it on, ask yourself, would I be sharing this story? Would I? Would I be doing it if they were here? Ask yourself, would I share it for their good? Would I be sharing it for the good of others? Would I be sharing it for the good of God's kingdom? Or would I be sharing it with them for some other reason? Why do I want to share this story? And if I share it, what kind of witness will I be given? Will it be a witness that points others to Jesus, to his love, to his kindness, to his forgiveness, to his truth? Or will it be one that points people away from Jesus? What kind of witness will I be given if I share this story? Friends, gossip is a huge issue. Be careful with your words. 
love others. Love others with honest words, with careful words, and number three, love others with building words. With building words. Ephesians 4.29 says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. But only what is helpful for building others up according to your needs. So let me ask you, when you speak, do you build people up or do you tear them down? Do when you speak, do you build your marriage up or do you tear it down? When you speak, do you build your children up or do you tear them down? What do you do when you speak? Do you build up or tear down? Be honest, I don't think many of us have any idea. I really don't. I don't think any of us have any idea of how deeply we impact others with our words. I'm going to draw your attention to the screen. I worry that she's inherited... Um, oh, gosh. My number one hate on my body is my eyes are wonky, my bingo arms. I have very big legs. I'm not keen on my legs, but I just try to focus on the fact that they're very strong and that I'm a very good runner. I have a belief that mm, the fact that I smile a lot has a lot to do with why my skin stays nice. <laughs> Oh, that's how it's, um, Phoenix's list. Okay. Um, eyes, we don't like our eyes. Oh, she said her thighs too, didn't she? She said her legs. We both don't like our nose, I think. Don't like my arms, and she doesn't like her arms either. So I've put hips and sort of bum areas, sort of upper thighs, and Lily's put her legs as well. I have tried to make my girls feel good. Well, I did say to her, I don't like this thing of, you know, these body parts of mine, and I think that's why she probably picked it up. Yeah, looking at it, she really picks up a lot of my ways. She does. Just be confident with yourself and how, just realise how um, you can influence your child. Have a look. Look, those are things that I like. <laughs> bum. Yeah, I do like my bum. I like my face because it's smiley. Legs. You wrote legs. Why do you like your legs? Because they're good for running. Really? Uh -huh. Is that why you like them? Self worth and beauty. It is an echo. It can echo from me to them and then from them to others. Be happy. Just be happy. <laughs> how I feel about myself really affects how she feels about herself. <laughs> Why do you like your mole then? Because it's the same as yours. They have the power to build up. They have the power to tear down. They have the power to bring life. They have the power to bring death. How are you using your words? Because our words have power, we need to think before we speak. And think is an acrostic. The T in think stands for truthful. Before you say something, ask yourself, is it truthful? Is it? Is it actually the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Is it truthful? H, is it helpful? Is it helpful or is it harmful? What is it? Is it inspirational? Is it going to build up or is it going to tear down? Is it going to bring life or is it going to bring death? Is it inspirational? And is it necessary? Ask yourself, is this something that really needs to be said or I'm just talking too much? You know, here's the truth, friends. Sometimes things aren't necessarily wrong. They just aren't necessarily necessary. K. 
K is a kind. Is a kind. First Corinthians 13 says love is kind. Is a kind. And so friends, before you speak, think. Is it truthful? Is it helpful? Is it inspirational? Is it necessary? Is it kind? Think. Now, let me close with some of these thoughts. I've always been really fascinated by how much we as people talk about investments, right? We do it all the time. We talk about investments. Why? Because the more valuable something is, the more concerned you and I ought to be about it. It's called good stewardship, right? Now, let me ask you something. And think very carefully here. When you and I talk about investments, what's more important, our words or our wealth? Our words or our wealth? What's more important as an investment? The Bible tells us that wealth is only going to last as long as you and I are here on earth. We can't take it with us. It is a temporal investment. But our words, our words have eternal impact. Jesus says on the day of judgment, you and I will stand before God and we will give an account for every careless word that we have spoken and we will be rewarded for every building word that we speak. Our wealth is temporal, but our words are eternal. I want to share a letter with you uh, from my dad. In my senior year in college, which is a long time ago now, I suffered an injury that looked like it would impact my ability to play professional football. I'd been running and I'd been lifting since I was in the fourth grade, and my dad, who knew how hard and how long I'd worked, sent me this letter. Dear Derek, Mother and I have been praying for your your recovery and that you'd have a great season for the rest of the year. We know, however, the fear and the uncertainty that must be with you at this time. That's the reason I'm writing this note. I want you to know that although there is built within me a fear, a sense of competition, and a strong desire to win, that is a huge understatement. And although I'm very proud of you for all the accomplishments you have made athletically, I know that football is not all there is in life, nor is it the most important thing in the world. So whether you play or do not play in the future as a pro is not significant, to your mother and me. What is significant is that you never give up trying to do and to be the best no matter how difficult the circumstances. Derek, you've been given a gift by God, physical size and ability, and you've worked hard to develop this. Now there are obstacles in your path that hinder you in using your gifts as fully as you could. I've been greatly concerned for you because I know what a disappointment this has been. Well, driving to Columbus, we were back in Ohio. I was praying about this, and these are the thoughts that came to me after I prayed. First, like Eric Little in Chariots of Fire, as a Christian, you have something to prove. No matter what circumstances, you have to get up and run the race to win for the glory of of God. There is a real sense in which your faith is on trial. How does a Christian respond to adversity and deep disappointment? He gets up off the ground and drives himself doubly hard to run the race to the finish. Prepare yourself to do a super job in body and mind. When you get your chance, you too have something to prove. Secondly, let's suppose for a moment That for some unknown reason, you don't get the chance you want or deserve to perform on the level that you're capable. Whatever tomorrow may hold. (laughs) Whatever tomorrow may hold, can you commit yourself to give 150% effort to play if you can? And 150% of it to support and encourage the team and the coaches if you can't. Again, you got something to prove that others may never understand. But Christ will. And so will we. 
Maybe these thoughts are for my benefit more than they are for yours. Please forgive me if they are. Whatever happens, we want you to know that we love you, Debbie and Jessica. The other girls weren't born yet. We share your pain and look forward to sharing in your accomplishments. We know with God's help, you will rise above this and every other adversity life may bring you. Because with Christ, we can do all things through him who strengthens us. And with Christ, nothing is impossible. Love, Dad. I didn't cry like this when I practiced. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I received that letter 38 years ago. 38 years ago. And hear this, those words are still shaping me. And they are still forming me. As you can tell, they still move me. They still fill me with faith and with hope and with determination to be my very, very best for God. My dad's investment verbally is still paying dividends in my life, and I will take those words into eternity. Hear this. I don't know what kind of words have been invested in you, but hear this. No matter what kind of words have been invested in you, you have a choice. You have a choice about the kind of words that you're going to invest in others. And so invest wisely. Invest wisely because your words have eternal consequences and eternal significance. Now if you would, I'm going to invite you to bow your heads and to pray with me. Let's pray. Lord, I want to invite you on behalf of all of us to take control of my mouth. To do with and to say through me and others here exactly what you want to have said. I want to speak. We want to speak the words you place on our tongues. And so, Lord, give us honest words of love. Careful words of love. And building words of love Lord I'm personally asking for myself and for others for your help I know you love us I know you want to use us you want to use us for your glory and so in your name and for your glory we pray all these things and all God's people said Amen